Gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the access. We are so aware of our limitations and how little we understand. I just pray that you would seal to our hearts the truth, filtering out all of that which is foolishness, sealing to our hearts the truth of your word. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Just wanted to put a, another quick video out here before Christmas. Uh, we're only just a few days away. Uh, I so wish that all of you have a the most blessed Christmas ever. And, and I say that because of what we're going to be looking at and what we have been looking at here in 1 John. And that is how that the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we're, we're celebrating His birth, but it's, we're really celebrating more than that because we can't separate His birth from all that He did for us in Christ. We have been studying together uh, through the first epistle of John, uh, verse by verse, and in our last study together, I tried to stress the fact that we are not born of God because we believe Jesus is the Christ. We believe Jesus is the Christ because we've already been born of God. That's the order. Modern evangelism has reversed it. It's a truth that's sadly neglected in evangelical circles today. And I suppose if it has to be if there's one word that describes my faith, I suppose reformed is probably the best word that would fit me. But it really wouldn't be quite right. A uh, reformed minister would say, well, there's that idiot Stephen, you know, over there who believes that there are people out there who are actually walking around who are going to heaven who haven't yet believed. And yet that is exactly what I believe. And the reason I believe that is because that is what our text says. Multitudes of people from countries where Christ was never preached, who are God's children from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Not because they did anything, but because they were born by God from above. You know, a thousand sermons can be preached on 1 John 5, 1. If you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, you'll be born of God. Not what it says. It doesn't say that that in John he doesn't say that in John chapter one, it doesn't say that in John chapter five, and it doesn't say that in John chapter eight. Same author, and it doesn't say that in John chapter ten. You believe because you've been born from above. You're not born from above because you believe. And that's the truth that's sorely neglected today. And one brings glory to God. And the other glorifies man. And all of Scripture exalts Christ. Those, those of you out there who have not yet believed, you know, if you would just put your faith in Christ, He would reach out to you. You know, you would become a new creation in Christ. All your sins would be forgiven. And you'd be headed for heaven. It's, it is an emotional appeal. It sounds great. But it isn't biblical. Every single last one of you came to believe that Jesus Christ died in your place only because you were first born from above by the will of God. And in trying to, to stress that truth, what I believe doesn't fit the Reformed position. The, the Reformed position is that we were born again when we believed. Okay, Scripture nowhere says that. I do not believe that there ever was a time when God's children were headed for hell. We were all once dead in trespasses and sins, but dead doesn't necessarily mean spiritual death. 
I want you to consider that the prodigal son was dead as far as his father was concerned, but he was a son. Did he suddenly become a son when he came home? No. He was the son even in the far country. Separated from his father does not imply an absence of sonship or an absence of being a child of God. So it depends on your definition, really, I, I suppose, of the word death. I'll tell you that to most Christians, the word death means, well, headed for hell. Even though, you know, if the prodigal son had remained in the far country and died there, he would have died as his father's son. Dearly beloved, I am absolutely persuaded that nobody can believe unless he is already a believer. When the father said, this my son was dead and is alive again, I think he's speaking of fellowship. All right, let's, let's go on. And looking straight at the text that we've been looking at here in the fifth chapter of 1 John, we know that we believe because we've been born again by God. We know that we, have, we love the children of God. We love the children of God because we have been born of God. And we keep His commandments. We guard His commandments. The word is guard. And the reason this is true is because we're in the same family. You know, we really know experientially, this is the word gnosko here, that we love the children of God when we love God and guard His commandments. And once again... You know, people will say, you know, boy, I, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Uh, I mean, I don't really keep his commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. We keep his commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. They're not heavy. They're not grievous. So in going, in going through this epistle, we see them all over. We see that all over. Verse 23 of chapter 3, we read, And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. You see that in your life, and you know that you're His. They're not heavy commandments. Much of Reform theology says the law of God may have been fulfilled in Christ, but it's still active and we're subject to the law of God. And dearly beloved, that is not true. Not only are we not under law as a rule, a principle of life, we died to the law, but we guard His commandments. His commandment is that we love one another. And if you stop and think about that, you understand what Christ said when he said that all the law is fulfilled in one word, that you love your neighbor as yourself. You know, if you love somebody, you're not going to steal his wife or his horse. If you love somebody, you're not going to punch him in the jaw. You know, if you love somebody, you're not going to kill him. There's not anything that you can think of that's bad to do, that, that you would do if you really love someone. His commandments are not burdensome because we're not under law, we're under grace. And now we see in verse 4, all who are born of God, this is a perfect passive participle, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Well, Steve, see Steve, it's our faith. Well, what is that faith? That faith is the finished work of Jesus Christ. And folks say, oh, no, 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 that's, that's how long and tenaciously I hold on. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. What you believe is that Jesus Christ, God Almighty, left the glory of heaven and became your kinsman redeemer and died in your place. And we're going to look at that in great detail in the next several verses Dearly beloved, the thing that you trust in is not how you live or on what you do, but on the fact that Jesus Christ died in your place. That is the faith that this is speaking of. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is Christ that died. That's your appeal. Okay? When you stand there accused, your appeal is, 
I trusted Christ. He died in my place. The problem is so many people take that verse as their own personal faith. You know, how, how much do they trust? How much do they believe? And, and what it says is, you trust the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so no wonder it overcomes the world. Just how good a job do you think that Christ did, folks? And time and time again, man wants to add to the finished work of Christ. You know, tracts have been written, books have been written, volumes have been written. You know, he did all he could. Poor God, you know, the rest is up to you. And that's a shame. He did everything that was necessary to be done because he died in your place. And as a result, folks, you cannot die. And any number, any number of ministers get concerned and upset and worried and all stressed out about, about this, you know. Oh, well, people just don't seem to have that pizzazz. You know, people don't have the zeal that they ought to, or they don't have the zeal that I have. They don't get out and live for the Lord like I do. Therefore, there's got to be something wrong with them. You know, just trusting Christ. I mean, you know, isn't that pathetic? And so we have a great movement today that really argues for the evidence that you're trusting Christ. And so we all become just, you know, inspectors you know when nothing you could ever do could any way could in any way compare with what christ has done today we stand before him and and say i trust you you died in my place we're not presenting what we've done that folks is christianity and that is christmas why am i redeemed because he died in my place why am i going to heaven because he died in my place why do I stand before him without spot and without blemish? Because he died in my place. I'm not, I'm not wholly unblameable and unreprovable because of the way I live. And many a person over the years has told me, you know, that I'm preaching a very dangerous truth because I'm telling everybody, well, it just doesn't really matter how you live. And, and folks, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, it doesn't matter how you live as far as your relationship to God is concerned in, this, in, in the matter of regeneration, okay? You are not going to heaven because of the way you live. You're not, you are not one of His because of the way you live. You may pay temporal consequences for the way that you live, but you're His child. And you are only His child because He died in your place. And so we're not looking at our faithfulness here. But the testimony of that faith and the testimony of three witnesses that is showing us that our faithfulness is a trust in the faithfulness of our Redeemer and our Savior, Jesus Christ, dearly beloved. Grasp firmly God's faithfulness. It's what He desires the most of us. Few passages of Scripture have produced such a, a mass of widely divergent interpretation as verse 6. This Son of God is He who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He came through water and blood. This may be regarded as one of the, the main, really, propositions of, of this epistle, that the eternal Son of God is identical with, this, with the historical person, Jesus, of the water and the blood. Widely, there's been widely differing interpretations that have been given on that. And folks, it would, be, it would be tedious and unprofitable to go through them all. There's a lot, okay? You know, you're, most of you are familiar with John 19, water and blood. I, I don't think that is referring to our Lord's pierced side, though that will likely influence your interpretation of, of this most perplexing passage that we see here in chapter 5 of this epistle. We don't have here any direct reference to the piercing of Christ's side and its results. So, at least for me, it's difficult to believe that this passage contains any definite uh, allusion to John 19.34. And why in that case the mark change of order? Water and blood instead of blood and water. You know, it seems like it would say, you know, blood and water. You know, not shedding blood only, but blood and water. 
And, and even more, how can blood and water flowing from the Lord's body be spoken of, of his coming through water, his coming through water and blood? And to me, the simplest interpretation, folks, is that water here refers to the word. I'm, I'm going to go out, out on a limb and probably go with, with what's, you know, mainly popular. Uh, he enjoined, he, Christ enjoined his disciples to be baptized, same as him. And, and without getting into a whole top, the whole topic of baptism, besides these two witnesses, water and blood, there's yet a third. That's the spirit that bears witness because the spirit's the truth is what our text says. And so there can be there there can be no higher testimony than that of of the truth itself. So I'm going to say I'm going to suggest that water here refers to the word and blood obviously referring to his incarnation. Now you may want to look at the bloody cross and his death as I don't think that's it. John came baptizing in water only. Take note of that of that fact. And take note of the fact that people came to John when there was, this was before there was an indwelling of the Holy Spirit to be identified with Christ. They came to him to be identified through baptism. That's what the word means. Identif and, you know, it's, and the atonement was only once a year. But water baptism is not a, pre a prerequisite to becoming identified as a follower of Christ. We... That is you and me. We have been baptized into Christ, Romans chapter 6. Rather than our coming to him, he came to us, having come to us through the word, the water, and being made flesh, the blood, the God-man, Jesus Christ. Paul you know, says, I believe in Ephesians, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a glorious church, without stain or wrinkle or, or any such blemish, but holy and blameless. Dearly beloved, will he do that? Is he going to has he done that? During our Lord's baptism by John, we hear the Father's voice come out of heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And it's always astounded me that I've never ever read any account anywhere of God the Father saying that about anyone else. And we see the Holy Spirit depend, descending upon him. And note that God never said that about anybody else. What the Word says is we've been accepted in the Beloved on the basis of what Christ did on on in his son in whom he's well pleased we are in Christ he's accepted us we can rest in him and we can just glory in the fact that when we come to this book to learn to grow to learn more about our 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 lovely lord and our relationship with him we can be absolutely confident right from the very start when we first open the book right away we can enter into that communion with him, that fellowship with him through the word with absolute confidence that what he has done for us is sufficient, that we stand before him without spot, without wrinkle, that God has nothing against us, that he doesn't allow anything to touch our lives except it be for our ultimate good, that he is supremely sovereign over every circumstance of our lives. He loves us more than we could possibly imagine. And I love you all too. Thank you. God bless you. Have a wonderful Christmas. And until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.